مسألة لا أعلم فيها خبرا that I cannot find a proof for it قلت فيها قول الشافعي that I am going to say in it I'm going to give the ruling of Imam al-Shafi'i لأنه إمام قرشي because he is the Imam of قرشي وقد روي عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال عالم قريش قريش يملأ الأرض علما علما that there is it has been narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that there is going to be a scholar from Quraysh whose knowledge is going to fill the earth. This is Imam Shafi'i, and his madhab in terms of scholarship, we talked about it last week. We were together. There is no madhab that you can bring that has more scholars than the madhab of Imam Shafi'i. There is, in terms of studying fiqh, I know that there are people here that might not be fully Shafi'is, might not be interested in actually implementing the Shafi'i madhab, but just from the aspect of learning, this will open you to a lot of ilm. And this is why we are um, going over. And he died in the year 204 after the Hijrah. He spent some time in, after Medina, giving his fatwa, he goes to Baghdad. When he goes to Baghdad, he writes his book, his books on um, the madhab that is the old madhab. And he spends two years there. So he writes, you know, the, the, the book that are, the, the madhab that is old. And then he comes to Misr, and this is where he eventually passes away. And here he authors the new madhab. So in the Shafi'i madhab, a thing that makes it different from the other madhab is that you see this progression of this is the old madhab, this is what he used to say when he was in Baghdad, and now this is what he is saying when he is in Misr. So you have like, out of all of the, the, the rulings, all the rulings that are there, you have a ruling that is of the old school and a ruling of the new school. If you compare the two, maybe there's about 17, 18, where the old is going to be taken over the new. But in general, you take the madhab that is new. Out of the books that he has authored, he authored many books. But the two most famous ones are, do we know any books of Imam al-Shafi'i? You have Kitab al-Umm. This is a, his, his master work on fiqh. So all of his rulings and all of the proofs that he has inside. Today, if you wanted to purchase it, you get it in about nine volumes. Then from there, he wrote a book on what field? First one to author a book in it. Usul al-Fiqh. And the book is Al-Risala of Imam al-Shafi'i. His student, Al-Muzani, he says that I have read Al-Risala 500 times. Every single time I read it, I learn something new. And this is a book that in terms of manuscript, the most complete one we have from beginning to end from a student of Imam al-Shafi'i himself. And it is preserved, alhamdulillah, in the um, library in Misr. So if you want to go there and look at it and go from beginning to end of Al-Risala, that is there. Uh, So that's not his first book, but that is one of his books, Kitab al-Umm. So uh, what, what is Umm in, in uh, mother? But linguistically, what does Umm mean? The origin. So what everything goes back to. So all of the rulings, this is what it goes back to. All of my rulings, this is where it should go back to. Kitab al-Umm. And he called it that because this is the beginning. Maybe a very popular question. Are these translated into English? Kitab al-Umm, no. Al-Risala, uh, yes it is, Al-Risala is translated into English. So the thing about uh, English translations, not only the, the, the meaning issue, in terms of books that we have printed, manuscript versus printed, right? Maybe there's like 6% of our books that have been taken from manuscripts into print. From those 6%, maybe less than half of a percent have been translated into English. So not like, you, you pick any scholar, majority of the books have not been translated. Maybe just a few here and there. You look at someone like you know, Imam al-Nawawi, so many books. We know two books that for sure are translated, and then there's a third one that's translated that a lot of people don't know. Right? You have Riyadh al-Salihin al al-Nawawi. Another book that has been translated is uh, At-Tibyan, 
uh, which is a book on the mannerisms of, of, of the people of the Quran and uh, the people that want to memorize the Quran, what, the, what should they you know, and, and things like, like that. So any scholar that you pick, majority of their books are either not even published or majority of their books are not translated, all of these. All right, so al risal is translated, Kitab al-Um is not translated. Um, طيب, so this is Imam Shafi'i, died in the year 204. Um, his madhab until today continues, um, just like the other former dhahib. Uh, again, due to the strength of the students that time, and then the people that came after and continued to build on uh, on the madhab. طيب, read for us, inshallah. <laughs> ليقرب على المتعلم درسه ويسهل على المبتدئ حفظه وأن أكثر فيه من التقسيمات وحصول الفصال. So he says uh, the, he makes dua for the imam and then he says في غاية الاختصار. If we were to translate this, okay, actually في غاية الاختصار ونهاية الإيجاز. What is غاية? What does غاية mean in Arabic? The end. نهاية. What does نهاية mean? The end. اختصار we just talked about مختصر so this is اسم مفعول of اختصار so مختصر is we said summarized اختصار is same thing so at the end of really stripping everything down then when he says الإيجاز same thing same meaning of summarizing it and the reason why he is presenting these like I am really going to strip this text down to a point where the one that is a متعلم the one that is beginning to learn that wants to learn, he's able to get it. And then he says, on top of that, it is going to be made easy على المبتدئ حفظه. That for the beginner that is interested in actually memorizing it, this is going to be made easy. This is going to be made easy uh, for them. Now, he says after that, I decided to put taqsimat. And this means like breaking it down. So if you look at the book, he'll actually start going like types of water. He'll give you the types of water. What are the rulings of the types of water? He'll give you the rulings. And he'll just continue breaking down. This is a book, even though the print that we have is not written in like bullet form. This is a book that is written in bullets. So you have the title, the chapter you're in, the things that you're dealing with, the bullet points of them. And you'll see once we get to, um, uh, once we get to the water. Then he says, um, here when he says, وَيَسْهَلُ عَلَى الْمُبْتَدِئِ حِفْظَهُ That this is made for a person to memorize. This is actually one of the works that a person that is beginning to acquire knowledge should memorize. Memorizing, memorizing, was the way of the scholars of before. Right? And they would only consider knowledge, مَا هَوَ sadru, What has been kept inside of the hearts. As the poet he goes, he says, "Leisa al-ilmu ma hawa al-qimatru." That knowledge is not what is kept in in the books, but it is what is kept inside of the chest. So whatever is memorized, they used to look at it as knowledge, and then they say, "What is the benefit of a person that says, look at the books that I have gathered in my house, but as soon as he goes to the marketplace, there's no knowledge for him. His knowledge has been left with him at home." So real knowledge is only what it has been kept inside. And this has actually been written in a way um, that it is meant to be memorized. And alhamdulillah, there's different, um, if you wanted to memorize this, there's like a breakdown from where to where do you memorize it. And if you guys want, we could bring that next week, inshallah. Right, for like this week, from this line to this line, I'm going to focus. And the next week, from this line to this line. And it should only take about uh, two, three months for you to get this down. And again, just the, this beginning is hard, right? This alhamdulillah all the way to the end. This is the only hard part. Other than that, one sentence, one sentence, one sentence. Right? The book does not become, um, um, you know, difficult. <laughs> طيب. Uh, and then... Uh, so the memorizing also starts with, with the basmala. With the basmala. So this whole book, the way you begin the... So the first day you would actually go from Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim all the way until uh, uh, right here, al-Khabir. وَبِعِبَادِهِ خَبِيرٌ لَطِيفٌ خَبِيرٌ Then you would go to أَقْسَامُ الْمِيَاءِ what, what, uh, Do you mind speaking up just because the AC is a little bit loud? So I, طيب, I, I will try to speak louder. If you, if it's possible, thank you. Okay. 
Uh, Bismillah, read for us now. So he says, I have responded to the question that they have asked in terms of, let me write this mukhtasar in fiqh. And the reason why I have done it, he says, for one reason, trying to attain the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant me tawfiq, that this is actually going to be beneficial for the people that it is intended to be beneficial. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is capable of doing this. Then he describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being latif and khabir. Um, these are from the asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, generally when latif comes, the next one is khabir. They generally always come together. And khabir is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowledgeable of his servants. He knows here what is intended is the intentions that they are making. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually knows what I am intending by writing this. Then Allah is all kind. This goal that I have of reaching all of these people, the only one that is able to actually help me accomplish it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With this we finish the muqaddimah. The introduction to the work. We should know the reason why it was written, the purpose of it, and what you and I should be getting out of it by the end of this. That a person that is beginning to learn, this is where they should start. And this has been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the time that he wrote it until today, the beginning of a person learning the Shafi'i Madhab will always begin with Matan Abi Shuja. This abridged, this summarized work on, on fiqh. Bismillah, inshallah now we are going to move to the actual text. Bismillah. So, Kitab al-Tahara, um, Kitab is, this is, we'll say this is the chapter heading, or we say this is the book. You know, Kitab uh, in, in, in the Arabic language, it means coming together or adding one to one another, right? For example, they say, تَكَتَّبَ بَنُوا قَوْمٍ That these people have, this tribe has come together. Or you have the Katib, which is the, you know when you have the army, or you have the horses, or you have these things, when they come together they are known as Katiba. When writing, because you're bringing words and letters together, this is where it comes from. That the words, when you take the pen and you begin writing the alphabet, and connecting them together one by one, because of this it is called Kitab. And this is the linguistic, linguistic definition. Kitab in the book here means the chapter. And it is going to be made up of abwab, sub-chapters. Then from there you have the fasl, which is, we'll say sub-sub-chapters. Because we don't have a, a, uh, a good word for it. So you'll begin, for example, Kitab al-Tahara. This is a, the book of purification. But you can't just get purification all at once. So let us break it down. From there, the next few words you're going to look at is the chapter of water. Or the sub-chapter of water. And then from there, you would break it down. Here, we don't do that. But you would break it down into more of that. You would say, this is the fasl. From there, you would go to the masail. And this is how books are generally written. At tahara linguistically, just means an nadafa Purifying yourself. Purifying, removing any type of najas. In the sharia, the sharia, it is a fi'il to stahtabu bihi as-salah. Or tastabihu bihi as-salah. That it, it makes salah permissible. That you are a person that can actually pray now that you are tahir, that you are pure. Or it is the removing of the mawani' of salah, things that prevent you from being able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it means generally tahara, it means like the actual meaning, which is, you know, hissi of removing najas from yourself, impurities from yourself. Also the ma'nawi of like, we are going to remove any impurities that are like, in our character, that you're not going to be a person that is going to lie, a person that is going to cheat, a person that has any envy, any hatred, these type of things removing from it, it is also part of at tahara Tayyib, Bismillah. Anwa'ul miya Anwa means the, uh, the, the, form, the types of water, the different types of water. Read the entire thing now. I'll read up to Wama'ul Barq. 
ماء السماء وماء البحر وماء النهر وماء البئر وماء العين وماء الثلج وماء البرد. So he said types of water, and what he means when he says types of water, water that you can actually purify yourself with, water that can be used to purify for you to be able to go and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he brings seven types. These seven types, he says, there are seven. He's giving you a number here, but he's not restricting it to seven. Because there might be water that comes that is outside of these seven that can still purify you. And the best example of that is in Hudaybiyah. The companions had to make wudu, but there was no water. Where did the water come from? Does anyone know? From the hand of the Prophet. From the hand of the Prophet. So water began flowing. From the, the fi- between the fingers of the Prophet Sallallahu So they began pure, making wudu with this water. That water is not mentioned here. But it is the, the you know, Tajuddin al-Subki, he says, he says, أَفْضَلُ الْمِيَاءِ مَاءٌ مَا نُغْمِ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَصَابِعِ النَّبِيِّ That the, the purest of water is the water that came from the fingers of the Prophet Sallallahu وَيَلِيهِ زَمْزَمٌ وَالْكَوْثَرُ وَنِيلُ الْمِصْرِ وَبَاقِ الْأَنْهَارُ He says, then from there you go to the water of Zamzam, the purest of water. From there you go to Al-Kawthar, the water of Kawthar. From there you go to فَنِيلُ الْمِصْرِ, the, the, the Nil in Misr. Then وَبَاقِ الْأَنْهَارُ, then after that the, the rest of the waters and so on. But the water that the Prophet used to make the door with uh-huh. So they used to take it for barakah, but they wouldn't take it to make wudu. Right? And then we'll actually get to, can, can water that is used, be used again to purify? And we'll get to that maybe next week. So he says sab'a, but it's not just restricted to these seven. Right? The water, t- clean, pure types are not just restricted to these seven. He's going to give you the general ruling of the seven types of water, and water that is going to purify you. The first one, he says ma'us sama. Water that comes from the heavens. Water that comes from the skies. Now before we continue, I forgot to mention why did he begin the book with Kitab al-Tahara? Even though Tahara is not part of um, like ibadat that we generally know. And that is, huh? Because if you're not pure, then nothing else. There you go. So he said, if you're not pure, then ibadat are not going to be accepted. And the ibadat that is here being questioned is salah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Buniya al-Islam ala khamsin. That Islam is built on five things. The shahada, salah, zakah, hajj, or sawm Ramadan. Here, you have iman, which is the shahadatain. Then from there, you go straight to salah. But you can't go to salah unless you're pure. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like we mentioned last week, miftahu salah, the, the, the key to prayer is, that you are a person that is pure and we also mentioned the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says that Allah will not accept the salah of a person until they are pure so because of this they will always begin with Kitab Al-Tahara and in writing when you look at any book one thing that you should pay attention to is what do they begin with this shows you the virtue of those things so here when he begins talking about water what is the best water? Water that comes from the heavens. Water that comes from the sky is the purest. All of these are pure water. But the one that has virtue, the water that comes from, um, uh, from the heavens. And this is the opinion of uh, Imam al-Nawawi in the Shafi'i Madhab. Uh, there are others that held the opinion that water that comes from the earth is pure. Because what is, what is more pure? Is it the earth or the heavens? Which one has more, um, like which one has more virtue? And uh, the Mu'tamad, the opinion of the Shafi'i Madhab according to Imam al nawawi the water from, from the heavens. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us about وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً لِيُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ That we've revealed to you, um, or sent down water from the heavens to purify you. وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً طَهُورًا And we've also sent from the heavens down water that is pure. Meaning pure for you to be able, grab these seats inshallah. Water that is pure for you to, to be able to uh, wash yourself. 
any water that comes from the heavens, from the skies, it is a pure water. Pure water, any water that comes from the heavens. And then he goes to the next one. He says, وَمَاءُ الْبَحْرِ مَاءُ الْبَحْرِ The Bahar is, is the sea. The sea here means salt water. So salt water. And this is because the companions were asked, or Abu uh, the companions asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I go at, on the water, on the Bahar. I take little water with me to be able to drink. If I make wudu with it, I will not have water to drink. What should I do? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says about this water of Bahar, وَالطُّهُورُ مَاؤُهَا وَحِلُّ وَيْتَتُهَا That this is water that is pure. So you can make wudu with it because it is pure. And also the dead that comes from it is halal. The dead that comes from it is halal. And here which the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam points this out to us is for one purpose. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made dead animals haram to eat. Right? حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةَ This is the first prohibition that comes when it comes to eating. De any dead animal is haram to eat. Except for what comes from the sea. What is dead when you remove it from the sea. And this is why this, this istisna is made here to tell you, hey, not this, this verse that you have, and actually all of the verses that tell you what is haram in eating will always begin with al mayta with the dead. And then uh, it goes on, mentions other, uh, 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 and these type of things. But here you're being given, except what comes from, um, from what comes from the ocean. And this is salt water ocean. Whenever they would say bahar, they would always mean salt water. They wouldn't mean fresh water. What they would refer to fresh water is the next category. And he says, وَمَا النَّهْرِ And Nahar is river. We'll expand the river to mean the river that flows. And also the, what could be considered sweet water. Right, sweet water, so fresh, not sweet, fresh water. Salt water, fresh water. So here would be also, this would include both of the oceans, right? In the first one you have the ocean that is salty. The other one you have the, the ocean that is, um, I think, when it comes to an nahar in the abiyat that we recited, which, which is the best nahar, which is the best river? Nile. The Nile, Allah Akbar. Huh? It's the best one, mashallah. Uh, he said, is, is, is that in its current form? I don't think so, mashallah. So, so, when you look at, you know, a Nil, you have a few ahadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that talk about uh, the virtues of it. One of them is the hadith that is found in the Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim on al Isra al Mi'raj, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw four rivers. Two of them were hidden and two of them were apparent to him. So he asked Jibril Alayhi Salam, what are these rivers? He says the two that, you can, that are hidden, they are the two from Jannah. The two that you see, they are the rivers of and Nil al Furat and the uh, Euphrates River in, um, in uh, Iraq. This is uh, right? This is the water of, of the, uh, the, the two rivers. Um, there's another hadith with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says about you know an Nil that an Nil is from Jannah, and if you were to put your hand inside, you would be able to find the leaves of Jannah. Again, is it you know today or uh, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ? For those of you that you know, mashallah, are from there and have gotten to be on there, this is for me. This was the darkest water I've ever been on. <laughs> All right, and then maybe it's because where we go generally, right? Maybe if you go a little bit down south, it's a little bit not as uh, you know as we know in, in Qahira the way that it looks, right? Um, it's daytime and the water is mashallah. But this is a river from Jannah. Right? This is a river that its asl, its origins begin from Jannah and it, and it is here. And then if you look at the benefits that, like Egypt, you could only survive if you live, live near the riverbanks. Like you have to live, this is the, over 100 million people have to you know, rely on this, um, uh, this water that is there. But if you wanted to make wudu, again, not recommending it today, but it is water that can purify you, inshallah, for you to be able to, um, to make wudu. طيب أخوي على الكوشة.
Huh? You said the sins of the Egyptians made it darker? Just like the black stone, huh? Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, <laughs> it was clean before. No, it's the, the sins of uh, yeah, Allah. No, and then I think we're very, uh, uh, we're very wasteful in, in the way that we take care of the earth, right? It's not just the need. Like all of the rivers have been uh, contaminated, destroyed in some form or another. Yes, but I was going to ask, because obviously a lot of these, um, at some point they were very pure, and now they're in some context contaminated. Uh -huh. Is it still permissible to, to make wudu? Uh, so, the, so, so, so the question is, with the contam contamination, is it still permissible for us to make wudu? 100%. A river, an ocean, they can never become impure. They can never become impure. And as we continue, we'll, we'll, once we go through the rulings of water, we'll understand why that is, uh, why that is the case. So then he says, ma'ul bahri wa ma'ul nahri. Then after that you have wa ma'ul bi'ri. This is well water. This is not something that you and I are accustomed to using. But in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in our countries, this, they would use well water. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa there used to be a handful of wells in Medina. For example, there is one that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa specifically asked about because of what the people would do around it. And what they would do is the skin of the dead dog or the dead dog, the meat itself, they would throw it into this well. The woman that would be using menstrual pads, they would also throw it into this well. Dead animals, it would also be thrown into this well. But the well was huge, and there was so much water inside. And you would never see these things. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he goes to the Prophet and he says, this is what is done to Bi'r Buda'a. This is how it is. Can we still purify ourselves with it? Can we still use the water to clean ourselves? And this is where the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِنَّ الْمَاءَ طَهُورٌ لَا يُنَجِّسُهُ شَيْءٍ That water is pure. Nothing will make it impure. For those of you that were in Uraqat, how do we understand this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is that every water is pure? Or? So water has to stay in the same form. If it changes color, if it changes smell, or if it changes taste, it's no longer pure. Also, there's a, a limit restriction, right? Which is that's the limit, like limit in terms of water size, how much water. I believe we said 512 or 20 liters in Waraqat. So if it's more than 520 liters, and the smell and the things don't change, the water is going to be pure. So this is ma'ul bi'ri, the water of the well. You could use it to purify yourselves. Today, I, I, don't, I don't think we use, uh, uh, we use well water, right? None of us are. We do? So I've drank well water a few times. So we have, when I used to live in Seattle, they used to have, you know, like the artisan wells, where you could go and pump the water. And those water usually are, mashallah, they're amazing. Haven't found it here, uh, but generally we don't make wudu with those, like we don't purify. But if we wanted to, we could purify ourselves. We could make wudu, we could make uh, ghusl, and so on. Any questions here? Then he says, uh, What is ma'ul ayn? Spring water. Spring water. Ah. So, question about, question about the purity of water. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so, then that, the, the impurity also applies to like river water for example because for the, the, like, if we talk about the Nile River yeah like, there are some areas of the Nile it's that, very yeah but it's very impure you can definitely tell the color is different mm -hmm. so that means those that, that would be considered impure water so you can't use that for no it would not be considered impure water okay. the changing of the smell taste only applies to less than 500 and 500 and something liters okay. anything outside of that Water cannot be made impure. So if you, and this, this is, alhamdulillah, again, we have, uh, the water system has completely changed in our times, right? This is not something we have to, like, we don't have to worry about going to a river here. I don't even know if you guys have rivers here. Going to a river and saying, do I make wudu? Or, e like, for me personally, like, sometimes you go to the beach, even though the water is tahir, the water is pure, and you could purify yourself with it, 
it just doesn't feel right, right? <laughs> like it feels, this is, this is, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like this does not feel like I should put in my mouth and rinse my mouth with it. I should put in my nose and rinse my nose with it, right? But this is, you know, pure water that a person could use. Tayyip? Huh? I mean, uh, do you have to, like, when you're making wudu in like a river, mm-hmm. there's always like the possibility that, most like there's like possibility of bacteria and stuff, do you have to actually, like, swallow the water or like, or put it in your mouth? Uh, do you have to yeah. or should you should be the question right do you have to put water like rinse your mouth and your nose you don't have to but you should this is from the completeness of of, uh, of wudu that a person does these things the more a the wudu of, of a person is complete the easier it is for their wudu to be accepted right the more that you do of any action the easier it becomes for it to be accepted. So for example, if you are praying Salah, do you have to read a Surah after Surah Al-Fatiha? No. But the way that we read Surah Al-Fatiha, we definitely need to read another Surah. <laughs> right? To just make it, okay, <laughs> inshallah, this is, has a better chance of it being uh, accepted. Uh, then he goes after, العين, and this is, so spring water, um, again, water that is pure, you could use to purify yourself. And then after that, وَمَا أُثَّلْجِي وَمَا أُلْبَرَدِي So, الثلج is what? Snow. البرد? Hail. Right, hail water and snow water. How do you use these things to purify yourself? So it doesn't mean actual, like using snow and just you know, putting snow on your body. <laughs> the water that comes from snow. And the water that comes from hail. So what you would have to do is you would have to gather these things. You would have to catch snow or catch hail, let it melt. That water, now you could use it to purify yourself. Huh. So what's the point of mentioning this if it's from the same like, source of the first one? So w- the first one, w- the question is, why is Ma'u Thalj and Al-Barad mentioned here, even though it is from Sama? Because you don't look at it as being water. When it is coming. So what happens when you gather it? Can you actually use that water? While the other water is just wa- rain is just water coming. And if you collect it, you have water. But this has to go through a process before it turns into water, which is melting. Now is that melted water pure? Is it clean? Can I use it to pure my, purify myself? Because in reality, all of the waters that we have mentioned are from the sky, right? Alam tara anna Allah anzala min al-sama'i that don't you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the water from the heavens and then once they got to the ground spread everywhere so the water that is in the ocean the water that is in the well the water that is in the spring all of it is coming from eventually from the heavens but why are these mentioned because they have like the, the way that we look at it is different so like snow and ice this is water that's coming but because there's this different process what is the ruling on it? That's why I mentioned it here. One so more question. You also mentioned that water that's less than 520 meters, even if it, the taste changes or the color changes, it's still pure. Mm-hmm. Now, let's say you collect some snow mm-hmm. and the it's dirty. It's dirty. Mm-hmm. Is that pure to make the ruling? So you have to, if, if, the, if the color has changed, if the taste has changed, and it's less than the number, so then you can't. Yeah. Of the yeah, so you would have to, ca- like, for us to use snow. You have to actually connect. No, if, if you collect little, right, and it's not from, you don't collect, like as it's dropping, you collect it, turns it to water, that's easier. But if you were to go and gather it, you want to gather more than what, what the, the amount of liters. And no one is gathering snow out here, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and no one's gathering hail. I don't even think it snows down here, so you guys are fine, inshallah. Uh, is it possible to heat up the water before you use it? Yeah, you can. And then, all, like, also, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's benefits in using sometimes cold water, right? Um, like, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on his deathbed, because of the fever that he had, what they would do is, what we would say today, a cold shower, right? And really, uh, the reason why this is included, even though you have, this, is, this is a book that is written in Basra, in Iraq, do you think they get snow there? I don't think they get snow. I think uh, maybe every couple hundred years the snow comes. But why are they mentioning it here? 
It's because of the dua of the Prophet وسلم, that mentions Allah purifies things through these, right? How does the dua go? We had a janazah yesterday. وَنَقِّهِ مِنَ الذُّنُوبِ وَالْخَطَايَا كَمَا يُنَقَّ الثَّوْبُ الْأَبْيَدُ No, man, you see. Uh, so it's Allahumma fillahu wa rahamuhu wa afrahu wa sa'imu al-khala wa khsilhu wa khsilhu bil ma'i wa thalji wa al-barad wa naqqihi min al-dhunub right so like wash him with these three different things that are mentioned and again where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is from is there snow rarely there would be snow but this is a form of uh, types of water that would purify and that's why it is mentioned here these are the seven types of water. Like we said in the beginning, there are other types. But generally, these are the types of water that you would use to purify yourself. And because it purifies you for salah, it also means it could purify your clothing. Right? It could purify more than just the wudu. It could be used to uh, cleanse oneself. Any questions up to here? Uh, Mm-hmm. So, does, it, does that mean that if the water is not clean, mm-hmm. it is pure, I mm-hmm. can still use it to make wudu or should I just say I'm So, it depends on what, like, what is the definition of clean? Like, water, what, what water is pure and clean? And have I been saying pure water? Okay, we're going to say water that is tahir. tahir. That's the word we'll use. Yes. Don't listen, don't, not pure water. Because that has a different meaning nowadays, right? So pure, that is water that is clean. Right? Water that is... The word pure just keeps coming to our mind. Water that is clean, we'll say. Water that is tahir. And actually, inshallah, uh, I don't know how much... Okay, we don't have time today. We'll go to aqsamul miya, which is another breakdown of water. Now, how do you actually use these waters? And then there are things like, okay... Water that is clean, the water that is not clean, water that is mixed, water that has a different color because of mixture and these type of things. What are the actual rulings on it? We'll go over it with Nilla next week. Any other questions? So if you, and this is probably an obvious question, but if you have dirty water, let's say it's less than 5 or 2 mil, mm-hmm. liters, and the colors change, and then you go ahead and you purify that through other sources. Let's say you filter it. Does that make it not pure? Yeah, no, and that's a different water. You've removed the impurities. Okay, so, so once you remove the impurities, it's no longer impure. Tayyib, uh, any questions from our sisters? Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify us through this knowledge, purify us through uh, water. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst the people of Jannah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Again, you have the book, open it. Don't, I'm not even going to say donation this next time. Page four. Not to page four. Open this, this page right here. All you have to do is scan the code and then figure out, uh, just see if it works. Fill out the form. See what happens, inshallah.